Hey there, welcome to the stream. I'm Josh Rushing, sitting in for Femi OK today. Listen, if you're watching this live online, that means you're watching via YouTube, and that means the chat box right there. Well, check it out. We have a live stream producer there waiting for your comments and questions so they can get them to me and I can get them to our guests throughout the program. So thank you for joining us, but be a part of the show too. Today we're talking about Afghanistan and drugs, but this time not poppy and heroin, but meth. Meth is starting to spread across the country. They're able to actually make it there in Afghanistan from a plant that grows naturally. These are new developments in the drug trade there. And actually here's what's happening with some of the people addicted to it in the country. Check out this. When I was very young, I went to Iran. There were 11 of us in one room. Only me and an old man were not using drugs. The rest were using, and I gradually started using the drug. The other side of this is it's actually bringing economy and jobs and commerce to an area of Afghanistan that could sorely use it during these times. Now, to discuss this issue, I'm joined by a panel of experts who I'm going to ask to introduce themselves. David, can we start with you? Certainly. Um, thanks for the introduction, Josh. My name is David Mansfield. I am an independent consultant and I've been working on the drugs issue in Afghanistan for the last 24 years and for the last couple of years, looking at the growing meth industry. And I, I can say this for David as someone, I've been to Afghanistan 11 or 12 times. I've covered it over the years. When I want to know what's happening with drugs there, I go to his reports first. I've been a fan of his work for a long time. So thanks for joining us, David. Mark? Thank you. Uh, thanks, Josh. Uh, I'm Mark Calhoun. I'm the representative for the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime uh, in Afghanistan. I've been there since uh, 2009. Um, focus on all of the aspects of uh, UNODC's work in the country, with, uh, of which drugs is a, a major component. Absolutely. Thank you for joining us, Mark. I appreciate it. And then from Kabul, Luka Sada. Thank you, Josh. Uh, I'm Mokadessa Yorish. Uh, I currently lead a strategic communication company called Lapis, and I have formerly served as the Deputy Minister of Commerce for the government of Afghanistan. So let's get right into it. David, you've been looking at the drug situation in Afghanistan for a, a long time. When did meth start to pop on your radar? Um, the first time we actually came across it was when I was doing some work on the, um, the bombing of the heroin labs in 2017. This was a policy that the um, US forces Afghanistan um, developed and they were taking out heroin laboratories across the southwest of Afghanistan in an attempt to reduce the amount of money that was available to the Taliban. So we started exploring this um, and in doing so, spending time in some of the heroin laboratories. Coincidentally, some of these places were also producing methamphetamine. Now, this had been produced for a number of years using over-the-counter medicines, and we could see the remnants of the bottles of, of uh, various decongestants and cough mixtures out the back of one of these labs. What intrigued me was the fact that some of these cooks in these labs were saying, we don't do that anymore. It's far too expensive. Um, and what I could see in some of the photographs that were being taken were some buckets, some large bar plastic barrels of green goo. And I started inquiring about this and it turned out this was a fedra, a wild crop that grows in the mountains of Afghanistan being soaked to make methamphetamine. And the argument that these cooks were saying is this halves the cost of production. Over-the-counter medicines, decongestants, we can't make a profit. The price in Iran is too low. So as a consequence, we've moved to this ephedra-based production. So as a consequence of that, we then started to track down what this crop was, where it was grown, and how the market functioned. So we ended up in places like Ghazni and Wardak, and then subsequently into Taiwara in Gore, and you can see some of the photos of people um, harvesting the crop in these areas. It grows completely wild. In some places, it looks like a grass. In other places, it, it's more of a bush, about two and a half meters in size. And this is harvested and brought down to the mountains. So we started doing more and more work following this market, this what we thought was a, a fairly uh, nascent market. 
and realized over time that this has developed quite dramatically. And the last piece of work that we just did for the European Monitoring Center in Lisbon was actually doing a lab count um, based on some further field work with Cooks in Bakwa. We could um, understand more about the visual signatures and how these labs operated. And what we realized was people were moving away from methamphetamine labs. And what we had was a growing cottage industry in ephedrine labs. And then that product was then being sold to make meth from the ephedrine. And we counted these labs using imagery and came across 329 labs just in Bakwa alone. So this was, a, this was evidence of a completely shift in scale um, and the fact that we, you know, it's, I suppose it's a bit like the coca industry when some of the, the market shifted away from buying raw coca leaf in places like Bolivia or Colombia to wanting to buy processed product. And so what we now have farmers who on one side they grow opium and on the other side they're also producing this very, using very simple chemistry and using cheap inputs, this basic ephedrine. And this is now turning up in a variety of different places, including the Iranians are seizing amounts of not just crystal meth, but ephedrine, suggesting that we may have, may have even repurposing of that product. So we've got this, this now, what we would say is, is a growing meth economy that links the lower areas in the deserts of the southwest all the way up the mountains where this crop's being harvested. And, and so, you know, we're seeing David, major... I feel like your analysis effects. on this... I feel like your analysis on this is, is really at the forefront of it. Mark, is it lining up with everything you're seeing from your end, or do you have a bit of a different perspective on this? Thanks, Josh. Um, no, what David is saying is, um, you know, concurs with the, uh, the results UNODC is uh, seeing. Um, we definitely, uh, your report very effectively covered the, uh, the abuse or the use side of uh, methamphetamine. Um, massive uh, drug use problem uh, throughout the country. We're talking about uh, possibly um, 3 million drug users, and this is from a survey in 2015 when methamphetamine had not um, reached the, the levels it, uh, it is currently at in the country. Then moving into the, uh, the rural populations, again, very definitely we're seeing um, an increasing numbers of uh, farmers involved in, uh, or the rural communities involved in this activity. Well, here, one of the things I would, um, you've touched upon it, uh, David was touching upon it as well, is the, the, the fact of the illicit economy. Now, an important thing that we have to take into consideration here is none of these rural um, population groups that are working in this area are actually getting rich from the activity itself. These people quite often get locked in a, uh, a cycle of debt to the actual traffickers. And if we really are to start looking at effectively address, addressing this problem, we need to really be looking at those who profit uh, from the illicit manufacture of, or the, I shouldn't say manufacture, but the illicit trafficking of methamphetamine. These are, there has been uh, an emphasis uh, in Afghanistan very much by law enforcement authorities to focus on product on the table, looking at methamphetamine seizures, of which there are many. The, the Contra Narcotics Police has seized over a ton of methamphetamine in Afghanistan this year already. We're seeing um, 50 kilograms was seized at the uh, international airport this year, uh, leaving the country. And this is in a year where there haven't been that many uh, international flights. But these people, the people involved in the ephedra extraction, the manufacture of the methamphetamine, and even the, uh, the low-level traffickers, these are not the people getting wealthy. If we really want to make inroads, uh, we do need to look at the the a deep dive on the illicit economy, getting into the massive amounts of money that organized crime are deriving from this activity and really looking at ways of um, effectively addressing money laundering, asset forfeiture, and really damaging those who are profiting from the, the um, activity. I have some questions stacking up from our uh, online community right now, but first I want to go to um, Luca Sedan and ask, ask her, you know, we're seeing images as, as we're talking about this of the drug addiction uh, addiction issue in Afghanistan. I know you're in Kabul. I'm curious, where are the women in the families in, in this picture? How, how does drug addiction there affect the women in Afghanistan? Um, thank you, Josh. I'm actually sitting here and looking at those uh, pictures and listening. 
to vote Mark and David, who are actually the experts on this, and it's pretty um, frustrating and 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 it's and it's sad. And I have to say that every morning when I go to work, uh, I pass um, cobble streets, and there are particular locations where, unfortunately, these drug addicts come together, and they have sort of made a home out of those locations. Uh, because for a major part, these people are homeless and they live in streets. So you can actually see uh, poverty um, on the streets of Kabul. And as a direct consequence of that, I would say uh, uh, people who have unfortunately uh, become uh, drug addicts. Um, there are not many women actually that you would see uh, visible on the streets, but that however, doesn't mean that women are not affected by this. Um, um, women are affected both as directly in the form of people who consume it and who are actually drug addicts, or people who have become drug addicts because the men in their family have been actually the one who brought it in the house and they started being a secondhand um, smoker or a secondhand um, addict and that initially led to their full um, addiction. Um, that being said, I think uh, uh, it, there's clearly a direct relation between the domestic, the rise in the domestic violence and uh, the increase in the number of people who become uh, addicted to drugs. And I think that clearly uh, affects uh, uh, women, uh, both directly and indirectly. I want to bring us some questions from our online community right now. Peter King has asked, which gangs are involved with meth? Are they the same as heroin or is this a different movement? It's also asked, why is ephedra, which is thoroughly medicinal, not used as a legitimate crop? So maybe we can talk about that in a minute about how we can do development responsibly around this. Uh, what are the levels of meth productions across the country? and Where is it taking place? I don't know. For the gangs question, Mark, do you, would, would that be in your purview? Well, the, uh, the, we are seeing um, polydrug uh, shipments off Afghanistan being moved out of the country. We're seeing um, uh, both at uh, Islam Kala border crossing from Herat into Iran, Spinbil like border crossing from uh, Afghanistan into um, uh, Pakistan. Polydrug consignments are giving an indication that it is the same groups that are involved in trafficking of heroin and uh, methamphetamine. So again, moving beyond the, the borders, we've had the, the seizures in uh, Sri Lanka, the maritime seizures, um, heroin, uh, methamphetamine, and ketamine being uh, seized uh, as part of the same consignments. So again, giving a, an indication that these are the, the same groups that are involved in trafficking these substances. Mm, right along the, 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 the same lines as always. Dr. Uh, James Theron Bradford sent us a comment. He's an assistant professor of history from Boston. I'm going to bring this up. He's talking about what, what this means, not just for Afghanistan, but uh, for the international market. With the international market, um, the Afghanistan's methamphetamine is extremely cheap compared to the um, costs that uh, um, companies would or the traffickers would be incurring in other countries. I think David uh, touched upon it. The, um, the, the fact that Afghanistan can use naturally occurring ephedra really undercuts the costs to the trafficking organizations. In other um, uh, countries, they are either having to divert uh, pharmaceutical preparations or they're having to do full chemical synthesis using uh, P2, uh, phenyl 2 propanone or going further back um, with uh, other uh, precursors, which greatly increases the cost to the trafficking organizations. Okay, I'm going to bring in a comment from uh, Dr. Bradford, actually. Let's, let's hear what he has to say. Afghanistan's emergence as a major source of amphetamines uh, does not bode well for the world, obviously, but especially Asia, which has a dramatic growth in the demand for amphetamines over the last two decades. But Afghanistan is really a symptom of this environment and this, this global illicit marketplace uh, of which punitive approaches to drug control haven't worked and they haven't uh, dealt with the drivers of demand. So I think more long-term solutions and sustainable solutions to this are going to need to focus more on reducing demand. And in that sense, public health approaches to drug addiction uh, and possibly even decriminalization of use will do more to reduce uh, drug supply in Afghanistan. Mikudasov, what do you think about the idea of decriminalizing drug use in Afghanistan? 
Um, I think the the post two thousand political economy in Afghanistan is clearly for a major part has been shaped by the um, production and trafficking of drag. Um, and I also think there's a direct relation between the um, um, coalition military presence on the ground and also uh, the law enforcement activities, basically, that has focused on um, uh, counter narcotic um, efforts. Um, so I think the, the trend that uh, we have been noticing, especially post 2014, after the co coalition uh, drawdown uh, in Afghanistan, has been the sharp rise on the uh, about production and trafficking, which has a direct link with the law uh, enforcement um, efforts. Um, so I do believe that there's a strong uh, uh, law enforcement component, uh, but I'm I'm, I'm not uh, particularly sure that currently it's being um, streamlined uh, in the uh, strategies in the counter narcotic strategies, uh, particularly in the form of de decriminalizing it. Mark, does the the Office of UN uh, Drug Control does it have a position on legalization or decriminalization of drugs in Afghanistan? Well, from what the, uh, the the comments made, definitely a health response with regards to um, drug treatment is definitely more in line with a punitive response. Um, so putting people in jail for using drugs is definitely a, an outdated um, uh, philosophy. It's an outdated uh, way of addressing this problem. So definitely looking at a community-based psychosocial uh, response to drug treatment will be much more effective than punitive um, measures. At the same time, uh, you have organized crime groups that are profiting out of this. Organized crime will continue to profit out of um, the activities and really chasing the money. It really comes down to um, not uh, decriminalization of the use, but not decriminalization of the actual trafficking activity. There, you need to take um, concerted action to prevent the traffickers who are uh, international, who are prepared to pay, prey off the weakness of um, the society. You know, the people who are involved in this in the rural areas, as you said, are, are, are not getting rich, but they might be making a living in a way that, that they don't have other options for right now. Uh, David, I think you mentioned Columbia as an example, or maybe it was Mark. Someone mentioned it earlier in the show. We have a video comment from someone in our community. This is from Shabna Nasimi. She's the executive director of Conservative Friends of Afghanistan, who also brings up Columbia as an example of how to approach this. However, contrary to popular assumptions, the illicit drug trade can actually create development opportunities and have a role in peace building. For example, Columbia's cocoa farmers use money from their crops to invest in their children's education or community projects to build bridges uh, or improve roads. This is not an easy problem to solve, but that's all the more reason to adopt an open mind and invite the input of the people of Afghanistan that feel the greatest impact. Holding on to a failed international policy of war on drugs will never produce peace or reduce inequality. So David, I'm gonna pair that with a comment someone just made in our YouTube group there about ephedra has tons of medicinal uses. Is there a way that we can actually turn this into a legitimate crop and, and not take away the economy that these areas have found around this, new, this plant? It has been a legitimate crop for a number of years. I mean, it's a crop that um, if you, the work we did in Gasney, people were harvesting this at very marginal levels and taking it to the pharmacist in, in the major provincial center, and it was being shipped to India. I mean, it has um, legitimate uses either as fuel or as fodder or as a medicinal crop, but you know, there's nothing as attractive as using it to produce methamphetamine. And much of the shift towards this in Afghanistan is a function of global developments, including some of the developments in Iran, as a colleague of mine, Alex Soderholm, has shown, when Iran squeezed down on its meth labs and on the, of the precursors that Mark was talking about, they had to source supply from somewhere and they came to Afghanistan. And some of the construction workers brought their skills back, some of the Afghan construction workers brought their skills back, set up labs, in a, again, very local level, and started producing this stuff to push back into Iran. And now we have a very good quality 
cheap product that is finding its way all the way to Australia. As Mark says, the profit margins aren't great on this. Um, I work it, we, we basically worked on about $30 a kilo, but this is, this is good quality crystal meth. And it is now moving across Southern Africa. It appears to be moving to Southern Africa, Eastern Africa, Sri Lanka. And as I say, turning up in Australia, where they say the purity level is equivalent to that of other other countries um, that have a much greater history of methamphetamine production. Mark, so is there some not- advantage to the meth coming out of Afghanistan? Uh, David saying that it's kind of a good pure product. Is one, how do you tell when you when you find meth in South Africa that it's from Afghanistan? And then two, well, why in the world would it be advantageous? Mm-hmm. Josh, the uh, methamphetamine in Afghanistan, or the export grade methamphetamine is of uh, its crystalline, which is a clear indication that it's already uh, extremely pure. So the, it would be um, difficult to, without extremely uh, involved forensic analysis, to determine whether the methamphetamine has come from a uh, plant based, uh, it's ephedra based, or if it's uh, pharmaceutical or um, chemically uh, based. So a, a lot of the um, belief that it's coming from Afghanistan would trend from the trafficking routes and the people who have been involved in uh, the, in the, the backtracking investigations that go into the, uh, the actual seizures. What we have been seeing though in Afghanistan is, as well as the pure crystalline uh, methamphetamine, there are lower grades of methamphetamine coming available in the market. And these are actually being tableted and distributed um, domestically in the country. Now, this is um, being done under the name of Tablet K. A lot of people are assuming that it was uh, ecstasy that was actually um, MDMA that was in these uh, tablets. But from our work with the Contra Narcotics Police Forensic Laboratory, we are finding out now that at least 70% of these tablets do contain methamphetamine as opposed to um, uh, uh, MDMA, which was supposed to be the um, licit ingredient. So again, very harmful um, for society uh, in the country, these methamphetamine tablets appearing of lower quality we're, meth on the market. We're running out of time, uh, but there are a couple more questions here from our online audience. Benny wants to know, is there a corresponding decrease in heroin use with the increase of meth? Does anyone know? Mark, that's probably you uh, or David. Yeah. There were some interviews that were being done recently that suggested um, by the BBC, actually, and they were talking to, to some of the meth users in Kabul, and, and some of the users there were, were talking about the fact they use both and they talked about these products i suppose a bit like on the supply side they're brothers um so people are because people are poly drug use because i want to i want to bring you in here do you do you know the the taliban's position on this and if they came down and put a complete crackdown on it, is that something that would be welcomed by the population there you know that's something that I've, I've kept wanting to intervene that you can't really talk about this as a problem without actually looking at on on without linking it to security and corruption in in, in the country and and unfortunately um the way taliban engage on this is that uh, um, they, this can equally be a local uh, driver of conflict at the province level and at the district level. So from what we are hearing, it's actually a main revenue stream currently for non-state actors, including the Talibs. Um, uh, so, um, and there have been conversations around um, the reduction in level of drug production and trafficking around the time when the Taliban were governing the country, but, but clearly from what we are seeing right now, they are actually profiting from this, and this is a major right. uh, revenue they're, stream. They're, they're taxing it at this point, but if they were to take over, it's unclear whether right. they would allow that to go or if they're just happy to tax it now to, to fund the war as it goes on there. Well, that's it. That's all the time we have for today. I want to thank all of my guests for joining us on this discussion, and of course, a, a topic, Afghanistan, that we will keep watching here in the stream in Al Jazeera English. And for all those joining us on the show, thank you. It's lovely to see you, and I will see you again next time. Thank you.